Hello everybody, this is Dr. Beter. Today is January 21, 1976, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 8. As we begin to celebrate the bicentennial of our independence, let us reflect for a moment on our past. Out of a vast wilderness our people created a nation with astonishing speed. Our forefathers brought forth a nation with the highest and most stable form of self-government ever conceived by man. It was unique in the entire world, a prescription for freedom simple enough for everyone to understand, yet truly a work of genius. It's no wonder that from our earliest days as an independent nation the eyes of the entire world have been riveted on the United States of America. What was initially called our noble experiment was spectacular in its success, and America's banner of freedom became a symbol of hope for oppressed peoples everywhere. Would any of this have happened without the clear patriotic vision of our Founding Fathers? Could it have come to pass without the courage of George Washington? who in 1776 led the famous surprise attack on the far stronger British forces in Trenton? Would we have had our inspired and inspirational Constitution if Benjamin Franklin's call for prayer had not broken the impasse over representation at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787? Could we ever have had a government sensitive to the wishes of the people if the humility of our early leaders had been replaced with the arrogant boasting practiced by our corrupt rulers of today? And would we have had a nation such as ours if our Founding Fathers had believed in the internationalism promoted today by the Rockefeller Brothers? What would our Founding Fathers say today if they could see us meddling in the affairs of other countries? How would they feel about the tremendous sacrifices they endured if they could see our rulers of today building up another nation to become our slave master at our own expense? We would all do well to look back once again at the patriotic words of George Washington in his farewell address as President. He advised his countrymen to extend commercial relations to foreign nations with as little political connection as possible. He did not advise against such commercial relations in themselves, nor did he object to temporary alliances with foreign nations when needed in an emergency. But he did give us a clear, strong warning that has an urgent relevance to us today, and I quote, to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. Is this rule being followed today by our Rockefeller rulers and their client followers? Since 1917, the Rockefeller Empire has been allied with the Soviet Union, with which we are to be merged against our will, and with the Soviets ultimately in the driver's seat. As I explained last month and have often discussed on other occasions, we the people are the victims of an alliance between State Socialism in Russia and Corporate Socialism here under the Rockefeller Brothers. And, my friends, this is not an informal arrangement. Since at least the early days of the Eisenhower Administration, which was actually run behind the scenes by Nelson Rockefeller, there has been a White House directive which I am about to reveal to you for the very first time. It is short but not sweet. It establishes as a prime goal of Federal policy, and I quote here, 
to so alter life in the United States that it can be comfortably merged with life in the Soviet Union." Unquote. My friends, I do not merely challenge, I dare President Ford or anyone else in the White House to deny the existence of this directive under oath. But they won't do so unless they have become so desperate that they are willing to gamble on any bluff, because I have access to documentary evidence on this matter that could immediately convict them for perjury and lead to impeachment and or prison. Yes, this short White House directive, my friends, quote, to so alter life in the United States that it can be comfortably merged with life in the Soviet Union." Unquote. That's the key to all of our domestic and foreign policy today. It explains why we have become the factory for the Soviet Union. It explains why so many multinational corporations are being used to build up the Soviet economy while depressing our own. It explains why the many huge Rockefeller-controlled tax-exempt foundations which are all working in this direction are immune to prosecution for their flagrant violation of their charters. It explains why the Rockefeller-controlled banks and financial institutions are so single-mindedly financing the Soviet juggernaut at American taxpayer expense. It is little wonder that Nobel Prize winning biologist George Wald, in an article a year ago about the runaway power of the multinational corporations, said, and I quote, Hence no nation so closely resembles the United States as the Soviet Union. Unquote. My fellow citizens, it is essential that we halt this horrible slippage backward into tyranny. If we are to survive as a free people beyond this our bicentennial year, we the people must rise up and make the government that belongs to us turn its face forward once again to the still new, still fresh ideals and principles that launched our great nation. I am absolutely convinced that we can still do it if we will. Last month I recorded AudioBook No. 6 entitled, What We Can Do to Save America, to explain the strategy which I believe can and will do the job, and already alert citizens all over America are listening to this message, getting to work and making suggestions. If you will join in the task, we can do it. Meanwhile, I intend to keep informing you about what we are up against, how events are progressing and what plans are being formed behind the scenes. To this end, I want to talk to you today about three topics that all reflect the drive to merge life in America with that in the Soviet Union. Topic No. 1, our charges for a citizen's indictment on the Fort Knox twin scandal cover-up. Topic No. 2, Rockefeller progress and problems in their drive to drag our economy down to the Soviet level. And Topic No. 3, so-called detente and the ignored prophetic warnings of George Washington. Topic No. 1, it is essential that I give special attention to the first topic today but I will deal with the remaining two topics as fully as I can in the time that remains for them. 
almost two years ago in April 1974, during Congressional testimony before a subcommittee of the House Banking and Currency Committee. I first revealed that the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox had been looted of its gold. I stood ready to present evidence to substantiate my charges, but nothing whatever was done. Having been failed by Congress, I then took my story to the public through lectures, radio talk shows, and publication of my charges in a national weekly newspaper. Faced by this public pressure, the government responded by setting in motion a well-orchestrated cover-up, a cover-up far more massive and more serious than that of the Watergate scandal which removed our last elected President from office. The actual cover-up began on September 23, 1974 with the carefully staged visit of Congressmen and newsmen to Fort Knox. I have detailed the ensuing cover-up, among other things, in my audio book No. 2 on the Fort Knox Gold Scandal and what it means to you. I have also given you continuing updates since June 1975 by means of my monthly AUDIO letter. In October 1975 I revealed what I had just learned at that time that makes a twin super scandal of the Fort Knox situation, namely the presence of about 60 pounds of radioactive liquid super poison processed from deadly plutonium-239 in the central core vault of the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox. The canisters of poison put there in 1968 by the CIA are corroding and leaking faster and faster, endangering the health and even the lives of millions of Americans in the southeastern United States. The government's response to this second, far more serious half of the Fort Knox scandal has been the same as to the first, cover-up. I have explained in recent months how first Senator Frank Church and then Congressman Otis Pike, Chairman respectively of the Senate and House Intelligence Committees, have become parties to the Fort Knox plutonium scandal cover-up, and how bureaucratic gobbledygook is being used by government officials to avoid giving straight, honest answers about the situation. But now the Fort Knox scandal cover-up is getting even worse. It has recently entered a new phase of outright lying and of masking the evidence concerning my charges. They are going for broke, and they have long since passed the point of no return. The same tactics of lying and cheating by the government that are standard practice in the Soviet Union, into which we are to be merged are now being used here in the United States, and these tactics are far more effective here than in Russia because Americans, unlike Soviet citizens, have not yet learned to expect their government to lie to them continuously. Up till now the main cover-up approach has been one of evasion, but now an atmosphere of desperation on the part of the wrongdoers is becoming increasingly apparent. For the very first time Treasury Secretary William Simon has made the fatal mistake of actually lying in writing, no less, about a crucial matter, the existence of the central core vault of the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox. We have challenged the government to either confirm or deny its existence in the past, and we have identified it not only by this name, Central Core Vault, but also by describing it to avoid any possibility of misunderstanding due to terminology. In a letter to a friend of mine dated December 10, 1975, Simon said the following, and I quote, the allegation that plutonium-239 is, or ever has been, stored at Fort Knox in a central core vault is false, and the Army has just conducted an extensive test 
of the Boolean Depository and has found no evidence of radioactivity. I should add that there is no such thing as the Central Core Vault." Unquote. Notice that Simon's denial of the presence of Plutonium-239 at the Depository is tied right in with his denial of the existence of the Central Core Vault. Obviously, if there is no Central Core Vault, then it cannot contain Plutonium-239. But on the other hand, to have any faith that his denial about the Plutonium is truthful, you must also believe his assertion that there exists no Central Core Vault at the Depository. If he would lie about one, he would lie about the other. With that in mind, please listen now to an excerpt from another letter, this one written to one of my associates by a retired Lieutenant General, John L. Ryan, Jr., a former Commanding General of Fort Knox. General Ryan probably knows more about the Depository than anyone else who ever commanded Fort Knox. He spent two tours of duty there before he returned a third time as the Commanding General, and when the gold was moved to Fort Knox to be stored there for the very first time in 1937, it was he who was placed in charge of the actual physical movement of the incoming gold into the Depository. With regard to the disputed Central Core Vault, he says, quote, When I use the word vault, I am referring to the central core of the Depository where the bullion was stored. This vault was below ground level and could be entered only through a specially constructed bank-type door that opened onto a screw lift. This door was in the receiving shipping area of the Depository. The receiving shipping room was above ground level. The vault was below ground level. Around the vault proper, or central core, below ground level was a passageway. On this passageway were a number of cell-like compartments. There was no means of entering the vault from this passageway." Unquote. My friends, the passageway with its compartments are all that the visitors saw in September 1974. The existence of the Central Core Vault, which is where the gold, if any, should have been, is absolutely confirmed by General Ryan. And as his letter makes clear, the 1974 visitors had no chance of finding out about it while wandering around in the passageway and looking at the small compartments you heard and read about in the news. Such bold-faced lying is bad enough, but the mounting desperation of the Rockefeller brothers and their lackeys over Fort Knox now goes even beyond mere lying. It is standard practice, whenever an extremely damaging secret is in danger of exposure, to distract attention from it and confuse the issue by deliberately exposing something else, something far less serious and dangerous than the secret being hidden, yet shocking enough to satisfy the public's appetite for the truth. With our totally manipulated government of today, a good rule of thumb is whenever something that looks really damaging is revealed, ask yourself, why are they letting this out of the bag? What is it that is worse than they are trying to distract my attention from? Thus, for example, Senator Church's uh, sensational revelations last summer about deadly shellfish toxins and the like fooled many into believing they had been given the whole ugly truth about CIA misdeeds, but actually he was covering up what he knew about the insane nuclear super-poison at Fort Knox, something a thousand times worse than anything he revealed. Now, in the same way, a cover-up campaign has been launched in regard to the leakage of the plutonium-239 super-poison from Fort Knox, and it's horrible. 
A few days ago, on January 12, 1976, a truck carrying radioactive waste just happened to have an accident in eastern Kentucky, smack in the heart of the area now most heavily affected by radioactive poison leakage from Fort Knox. Fourteen of the 32 drums of waste on the truck fell off, and eight of them broke open and leaked. The newspaper stories around there about it contained the usual assurances that there was no danger, that it had been cleaned up and so forth, but leakage had occurred. Just six days later, on January 18, newspapers contained a big article about still another alleged radioactive waste leakage problem in Kentucky. The truck I mentioned a moment ago had been on its way to a nuclear waste dumping ground at Maxie Flats, Kentucky, which had been in use since 1963, and now we are suddenly told that the leakage is occurring there too. Federal investigators, those wonderful watchdogs we are supposed to trust and admire, claim that radioactive waste in steel, wooden, and even cardboard drums has been just dropped into trenches and covered up with dirt, and after 12 years they have just now abruptly discovered that some of it has gotten loose and is spreading through the ground, through the water, and through the air, and a study by the General Accounting Office while it gives the standard assurance that there is no immediate danger, recommends a crash program to correct the situation and develop systematic standards for safe disposal of radioactive waste. Now why all this sudden concern about leakage of radioactive contamination? And why does the spotlight on actual leakage cases just happen to be on Kentucky? After all, there are vastly more serious problems of this sort elsewhere in the United States, for example, in New York State, but so why Kentucky? Two reasons, my friends. For one thing, they are using the opportunity to continue the nuclear con game that has been pulled on you for years by assuring you even when there are nuclear waste leakages that you don't really have to worry about it. But more importantly, in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 7 last month I posed a direct challenge to the Federal Government to either prove or disprove my charges, and I spelled out a fair, objective way to do it. What is going on now is their answer to my challenge by spreading stories about other kinds of radioactive waste leakage in the general vicinity of Fort Knox, and possibly by deliberately causing such releases, such as occurred in the truck accident, they are feverishly tampering with the evidence. The program I suggested to use off-site measurements to detect leakage from the bullion depository at Fort Knox would as they can now argue, no longer prove anything conclusively about my charges because of these other radioactive leakages which allegedly have also suddenly been discovered in the same region. I, for one, would like to see the whole business about Fort Knox laid to rest once and for all, and I know you would too. I know that my charges about the gold and about the plutonium poison are true. But for the sake of argument, if I were wrong, I would rather be honestly proven wrong about any or all of them and be made a laughing stock than to have the American people's worry over this matter dragged out endlessly like this. Whatever the truth is, I want you to know. But the Rockefeller lackeys in the government know only too well that the truth is exactly what I have told you and they don't want you to know. They will do anything and everything to try to save themselves, regardless of how many other human beings they may doom in the process. And so, my friends, this is the vicious reality behind the smooth mask 
that our Rockefeller-controlled Federal Government wears. We the people must bring the pressure to bear that will cause these things to be honestly investigated and corrected. The United States is under the thumb of modern outlaws, and if we do not bring them to justice, they will bring us and our children to total ruin. So far the United States Congress has not seen fit even to consider my charges about the gold, about the plutonium, about anything. The problem is not that I don't have the evidence but that I have too much of it. The same applies to the Justice Department, the General Accounting Office, the White House, and so on, so on. But recently a Congressman who heard my testimony in Congress about the missing Fort Knox gold in April 1974 and who went to Fort Knox in September 1974 gave us a tiny opening, whether wittingly or unwittingly. His constituents have been pressing him continuously for some answers about Fort Knox, and in recent replies which were forwarded to me, he in effect challenged us to do exactly what we have wanted to do for nearly two years, to present our charges and evidence in a proper legal forum. Our response is a six-page open letter by my able co-patriot Mr. Edward Durrell of Berryville, Virginia. The letter is addressed to Congressman John B. Conlon of Arizona, but it is open because based on past performance we have little reason for optimism that he will take any constructive action unless he is forced to do so by public pressure. The letter presents charges which parallel completely even in legal form the impeachment charges leveled at President Nixon by the House of Representatives. It is a legal document, and you are the nationwide grand jury. Under our Constitution it is ultimately we, the people who constitute the highest human authority in our land, and it is up to you to decide. Do our charges deserve an open, complete, honest investigation in a proper legal form or not? If so, it is up to you to return a citizen's indictment by demanding that your elected representatives provide a legal forum through Congressional investigation or formal grand jury proceedings. Here now is Mr. Durrell's letter to Congressman Conlon of Arizona. I will be quoting from the letter from here on all the way to Mr. Durrell's signature. Mr. Durrell's letter is dated January 7, 1976. Dear Mr. Conlon, Your letters of December 5, 1975 to Ms. Mary Barrow and to Mr. Art Bentley, both of Lake Havasu City, Arizona, have been sent to me for comment. To that end, I write direct to you with copies to them and other interested parties. In your letter to Ms. Barrow, you state, among other things, that, quote, grand juries are impaneled to investigate criminal wrongdoing, unquote, and that if, quote, you personally have evidence of crimes committed in connection with our nation's gold holdings, Please let me know so that I can put you directly in touch with appropriate officials of the United States Justice Department who would have jurisdiction in this matter." Unquote. In your letter to Mr. Bentley you state, among other things, that while you have, quote, some misgivings, unquote, about the gold situation, quote, I can assure you that exposure to any radioactive poison would have caused me serious illness. Neither I nor anyone else who went to Fort Knox has suffered any such illness." Unquote. Please allow us firstly to answer your letter to Mr. Bentley. It is common knowledge in nuclear medicine that if one is exposed to alpha particle radiation of plutonium, 
Death due to cancer can come in a matter of months or years. It all depends upon dosage level and duration of exposure. In this respect, we would suggest that you contact Dr. John Goffman, former Professor of Medical Physics Emeritus, University of California at Berkeley, or listen to him by way of a one-hour tape cassette obtainable from Audio Books Incorporated, Post Office Box 16428, Fort Worth, Texas, 76133, Special Tape No. 2 for $6 postpaid. In this tape, Dr. Goffman speaks on the effects of radioactive poison, among other things. In addition, over 18 percent increase in cancer deaths in the first seven months this year over last year has taken place in the central eastern states, which has left medical authorities in the dark as to the cause. They felt they had made such tremendous cancer advancements in the last few years, and then to have such a high upsurge in the first seven months this year over last year in that area alone is baffling. One more thing about this radioactive poison in the United States Bulletin Depository at Fort Knox, here and after called Fort Knox. We know from sources in the intelligence industry that this plutonium poison was part of the plutonium-239 stolen by members of the intelligence community in 1966, and that this most deadly substance was processed in four plants two in Kentucky, one in North Dakota, and one in California, into radioactive liquid poison. It was then taken, 60 pounds each, to Peru, Panama, Bolivia, and Argentina under cover of a multinational cement corporation by a CIA officer, Harold Leroy White, for the sole purpose of threatening to contaminate the United States planned and built water aqueduct systems in those countries for political and economic pressure. Sixty pounds, however, intended for use in Argentina, was brought back by Mr. White and placed in the Central Core Vault at Fort Knox, where it has been stored ever since late 1968. The casks are now corroding, causing leakage and contamination over the entire areas east and southeast of Kentucky and as far away as Cuba. This contamination is endangering the lives of over 40 million people in this country. Can we afford to allow these people to be expendable? The Federal Government has now publicly admitted our charges that opium and morphine, 150,000 pounds and 24,000 pounds respectively, are stored at Fort Knox. Why will it not admit the existence of the plutonium? It is suggested that to do so might subject the government to thousands of legal actions involving hundreds of millions of dollars under the Federal Tort Claims Act and or the Price-Anderson Act, the 1954 Atomic Energy Act as amended, Title 42, Section 2011 and following, for, quote, extraordinary nuclear occurrence, unquote. That is, quote, any event causing a discharge or dispersal of source, special nuclear or byproduct material from its intended place of confinement in amounts off-site or causing radiation levels off-site and which has resulted or will probably result in substantial damages to persons off-site or property off-site." And why will it not admit the loss of our gold reserves? For the same reasons, legal actions, including those criminal in nature, and in the latter connection, we would like here to pursue your suggestion to Mrs. Barrow and list the charges of the high crimes committed relative to disappearance of the people's gold reserves. On behalf of the American people, it is here in charge that the United States Treasury Department here and after called Treasury, in violation of its constitutional duty to protect the people's gold, and in violation of its constitutional duty to take care that the laws relative to the safeguarding and custody of said gold be faithfully executed, has failed so to do, in that 
between January 1, 1961 and January 1, 1974, prior and subsequent thereto, Treasury engaged itself through its officers, agents, and in concert with others in America's corridors of financial power in a course of conduct or plan designed to convert unto themselves the people's gold entrusted to it for safekeeping for the avowed purpose of profit and unjust enrichment, and in a course of conduct or plan designed to cover up, conceal, and protect those responsible and to conceal the existence and scope of other unlawful covert activities. The means used to implement this conduct or plan have included one or more of the following. 1. Treasury has failed to render a true account of the amount of gold shipped out from the United States Bullion Depositories from 1961 to 1968 under color of the London Gold Pool Agreement. 2. Treasury has failed to reveal the true prices, if any, received for the sale of said gold or reveal the names of the ultimate purchasers of said gold. 3. Treasury has failed to give a true account of the amount of gold shipped out of the United States Bullion Depositories from 1968 to 1974 under color of an ad hoc committee composed of the Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, the Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisers, the Chairman of the White House Council on International Economic Policy, the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of Treasury, among others. 4. Treasury has issued a statement dated August 31, 1974, purporting to list 24 million ounces of good delivery gold at Fort Knox when, in actual fact, the Secretary of the Treasury admitted December 3, 1974, that such listing is false or misleading. 5. Treasury has taken December 9, 1974, without lawful authority, 2 million ounces of gold from the Exchange Stabilization Fund by a simple bookkeeping device, and four days later announced by way of the General Services Administration that there would be an auction of 2 million ounces of gold on an as-is basis January 6, 1975. In addition, a Dutch auction was held June 30, 1975 with the remainder of said gold based on a price not considered best for the taxpayers of America. 6. Treasury has caused a statement to be issued April 11, 1975, which is false or misleading in that it purports to list all of the gold shipments out of Fort Knox when in actual fact such list omitted, among other things, a shipment of gold consisting of four tractor-trailer loads on January 20, 1965, which shipment consisted of 1.762 million ounces valued over $61 million at $35 per troy ounce the par value for official gold at that time. 7. Treasury has in its immediate possession and control the necessary keys, combination numbers, and time control data for the vaults, depositories, and their mechanisms. It thus has the highest duty to take care that its trust be faithfully executed, but it has acted in a manner contrary to its trust and subversive a responsible government to the great prejudice and to the manifest injury of the people of the United States by acting in concert with others to aid and abet to surreptitiously remove the gold under the cover of legal right. 8. Treasury has made false or misleading statements for the purpose of deceiving the people of the United States into believing that a thorough and complete inspection and audit have been conducted with respect to allegations that Fort Knox contains no significant amounts of gold and not accounted for in that an inspection trip to Fort Knox September 23, 1974 revealed one cell-like compartment number 33 
to contain only copper-hued bars. Mrs. Mary Brooks, the Director of the Mint Treasury, said, quote, it's all here, unquote. Her statement is analogous to the so-called audit of October 1974 of only three of the cell-like compartments at Fort Knox, which audit caused the report to be submitted to Congress February 10, 1975, also based on a belief that, quote, it's all here, unquote. Further, the inference given by the inspection trip and the audit was that the gold at Fort Knox was of good delivery form, and the remaining ten cell-like compartments were full of good delivery gold. 9. Treasury is withholding relevant and material evidence or information from the American people in total disregard or violation of the constitutional right of the people to know what has happened to its gold reserves and to its right of freedom of information for purposes unrelated to national security, the enforcement of laws, or any other lawful functions of Treasury, in that the Central Corps vote at Fort Knox was concealed from the inspection group of over 100 news media people, six representatives, and one Senator of the United States Congress. Ten. Treasury has unlawfully utilized its authority to cause the General Accounting Office to fail to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, in that the General Accounting Office, a legislative entity, was forced to have only two of its own people on a settlement committee to audit the alleged gold at Fort Knox, whereas Treasury had 13 of its own people on said committee. 11. Treasury has not caused to be made an annual physical inventory of the people's gold since 1953. Thus Treasury has failed to take care that Title 31 U.S.C. be faithfully executed by failing to make the required annual physical inventories. In all of this and more, Treasury has acted in a manner contrary to its trust and subversive of constitutional government, to the great prejudice of law and justice, and to the manifest injury of the people of the United States. Wherefore Treasury, through its officers, agents, and others in concert with it, by such conduct or plan, warrants such parties be brought before appropriate legal authorities to answer these charges and further for the restitution of the people's gold except that portion which is contaminated by radioactive poison, in which case said party shall be ordered to pay the current market gold price and for such other appropriate action as may be deemed just and proper in the premises. In support of the charges, please be informed that former Congressman Frank Shelf's affidavit dated April 7, 1975, in which he deposes and says, among other things, and I quote, that the United States Government was moving quietly as a church mouse out of Fort Knox, unquote, and that the gold was, quote, constantly and surreptitiously on the move, unquote. Fort Knox is located in former Congressman Shelf's congressional district. He further deposes and says that, quote, in response to my previous request for gold removal information, Treasury officials had been courteous and most friendly, but always non-committal or evasive." Unquote. Mr. Shelf had earlier made the same charges on the floor of the House of Representatives, but to no avail. See Congressional Record, page 15, 522, August 21, 1963. Further, Lieutenant General John L. Ryan, Jr., United States Army, retired in his statement of September 26, 1975, before Congressman Otis G. Pike in his office, has proved the existence of the Central Corps revolt and, in fact, has drawn sketches of it. In view of this 
There is no valid reason for the Secretary of Treasury to continue to deny the existence of the Central Corps vote at Fort Knox unless there is something deeply secret stored therein. There admittedly may have been the necessity for some secrecy in the 1960s when all the gold at Fort Knox was stored in the Central Corps vault. Why this secrecy now? Since the Controller General has stated on February 10, 1975, quote, as of June 30, 1974, about 55% of the gold claimed by the Treasury was stored in 13 sealed compartments at the United States Boiling Depository, Fort Knox, Kentucky. As further evidence, we call your attention to the balance sheets of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks, which carry gold certificate accounts as an asset to reflect a stated amount of gold, which in turn is reflected as a liability on Treasury balance sheets. However, it is submitted these gold certificate accounts reflect assets, gold, which do not in fact exist in Treasury vaults. This same situation prevailed in 1943 relative to silver when, quote, 14,000 tons of silver from the Treasury Reserve banking American paper money was secretly taken from Treasury vaults, although carried publicly on the Treasury balance sheets." Unquote. Cited in Tragedy and Hope by Professor Carol Quigley, page 855-1966-1974. We could go on, but suffice it to say that Treasury during our 18 months' investigations has not moved to refute by evidence the basic charges outlined above. Meanwhile, our economy is suffering by those twin disasters, inflation and deflation, high prices with high unemployment initially caused by the disposing of our gold reserves in secret and its attendant game plan. Mr. C. Gordon Tether in his December 11, 1975 article, quote, A New Twist of Fort Knox Saga, unquote, in the Financial Times of London stated, quote, But whatever the cost in terms of loss of face, might not the United States authorities be well advised to do whatever is necessary to demonstrate that there is no Fort Knox cover-up. In the light of what has happened in the United States during the past few years, deeds inevitably now speak louder than words, and a refusal to prove that they have nothing to hide is inevitably destined to go on fostering precisely the opposite impression." End of quote. Considering all of the above, would you please be so kind as to put the undersigned and Dr. Peter Beter, as you offer to do for Mrs. Barrow, quote, directly in touch with appropriate officials of the United States Justice Department who would have jurisdiction in this matter, unquote. I am authorized to state that Dr. Beter concurs with the cont contents of this letter and is fully prepared to give further evidence before a United States Grand Jury and any Congressional Investigating Committee in confirmation of the charges herein cited, among others. Further, I would suggest you personally bring this letter to the attention of the Chairman of the House Banking Committee, of which you are a member, for appropriate action. Failure on your part to do so will lend credence to the fact you yourself have become part and parcel of the cover-up on this vital matter, and failure on the part of the Chairman of said committee to take such action will further lend credence to the fact that he himself is in league with those underlying forces at work in America's corridors of financial power. Most respectfully, Edward Durrell. Topic No. 2. In my audio book No. 2 on the Fort Knox Gold Scandal and what it means to you, 
I warned you to watch for the stock market crash signal, meaning general unemployment in the range of 20 to 25 percent. This was originally targeted by the Rockefeller Brothers for the fall of 1975, but their schedules have been increasingly upset by their preoccupation with the Fort Knox scandal cover-up and by the anti-CIA actions of Indira Gandhi last summer. Even so, they are working frantically to get the pieces of their plan together again. Here in America, the government officially says that unemployment in November 1975 was 8.3 percent, but my own confidential information, direct from sources within the Bureau of Labor Statistics, is that the true figure for November was over 15 percent and still increasing. Therefore, the real unemployment levels are now moving closer and closer to the stock market crash signal levels I revealed nearly a year ago. Meanwhile, the Dow Jones averages lately are streaking upward artificially in a dream world of their own, totally divorced from reality. The stage is being set for a dramatic visible plunge downward if the Rockefeller Brothers cut the cable on the stock market elevator. And New York City, supposedly saved from outright bankruptcy by federal loans, is already far behind in its schedule for raising funds to stay afloat under that loan program. At the same time, the nation's banks are again the subject of widespread concern, and no wonder. Recently front-page stories have deliberately been planted in major Rockefeller-controlled newspapers about the alleged shakiness of the mammoth Chase Manhattan Bank and the even larger First National City Bank of New York, both of them Rockefeller-controlled. This is partly an attempt to lower the Rockefeller profile by saying, see, we have problems too. But more importantly, it is a deliberate effort to undermine confidence in our whole banking system. Banks and their customers should therefore watch for trouble. A publication which is doing an outstanding job of keeping on top of the banking situation as well as many other matters is the Daily News Digest. Box 27496, Phoenix, Arizona, 85061. This month's meeting of the International Monetary Fund in Jamaica produced no communique, no general agreement, only reflecting continued confusion there. Pressed by the smoldering Fort Knox scandal on one hand and the imminent war in the Middle East on the other, the primary goal of the Rockefeller Brothers has now shifted to just one thing, to abolish the official price of gold in America so that the non-existent American gold hoard can be quietly dropped from Treasury and Federal Reserve balance sheets. Most of the IMF gold is beyond their grasp for the time being. Topic number three. Last summer, Indira Gandhi cracked down on the CIA to stop a Rockefeller takeover of her country, India. Existing war preparations were immediately diverted to a new direction and since that time a major new Asian war has been brewing. In my monthly audio letter number six two months ago, I spelled out the basic strategy for this war, including the role to be played by the Middle East conflict in paving the way for the Asian war. Plans are proceeding rapidly. A few days ago, Japanese Prime Minister Miki fell into a Soviet trap. Reacting to brusque and uncooperative Soviet treatment, he announced that Japan will sign a treaty with Red China that includes the anti-Soviet hegemony clause desired by China. At the same time, as you may have noticed in news reports, American businessmen are rapidly packing up and leaving Japan, supposedly because their Japanese understudies are now ready to manage things themselves but actually because the Rockefeller brother interests are bailing out in advance of war, just as happened a few months ago in Lebanon. To set the stage for the big Asian war, hostilities are first to break out in the Middle East to provide an excuse for a limited American nuclear strike to cap off Arab OPEC oil wells. This will result in cementing the Sino-Japanese alliance for war, neutralizing Europe, and producing real suffering there, and causing gas rationing and a major body blow to our wobbly economy here in the United States. The terrorist attack on OPEC oil ministers in Vienna last month, engineered by our own CIA, 
was supposed to get the ball rolling in all of this. Two key oil ministers were supposed to be killed, leading to escalating reprisals and war. But the job was botched. For bungling this top priority operation, the man in charge, Richard Welch, the CIA station chief in Athens, was judged unreliable and executed by the CIA itself. And now Lebanon, which was primarily a distraction earlier, has now become the new springboard by which the broader Middle East conflict is to be enlarged. All of this, my friends, is part and parcel so-called detente with Soviet Russia on the way to a world collectivist dictatorship. Rockefeller Brothers internationalism, which is always portrayed by them as the path to peace, is actually a prescription for war, destruction, and enslavement. To them it is progress. In December 31, 1975, President Ford said on the eve of our bicentennial year, and I quote, Liberty is the most precious possession of our past, unquote. But fellow citizens, it is up to us to restore liberty to our future as well. Had we simply been heeding George Washington's wise warning to avoid permanent foreign alliances, the horrors I have been discussing would not exist. In his farewell address he also left us with many other equally wise observations that have direct application today. Washington's words and example helped launch the greatest nation on earth, and they can help get it moving forward again if we will allow them to. In this, our bicentennial year, I plan to return frequently to the forward-looking sage advice left to us by our great first President. Until next month, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.